Good morning, Harper faculty and friends. This is Stephanie Whalen, Chair of the Academy for Teaching Excellence, and I am here with the Academy team. Karen Harold will be co-facilitating today, and Melissa Basinger is with Janet Woods in the chat. Chris Dobson, Jenny Henriksen, Phil Mortensen, and Mike Bates from the Academy are standing by to answer questions. Amanda Nielsen has been captioning and posting the recordings of the webinars, and Katie Michalow has set up a creative way for faculty to earn CEUs for their reflections on the live or recorded webinars. We will show you how that works in just a few minutes. Before we get started, you might want to go to the settings cog to test your speaker volume. That is the icon in the bottom right hand corner that looks like a cog. You can click on that, test your speaker volume. It also has an option that you can dial in by phone if you're having a problem with your internet audio. You can also silence the chat feature if you don't want an alert each time someone posts in the chat. That's the area right there where you can uh, go to your settings and for future reference, you can locate the notification settings and deselect the ones that you don't want. All right, so welcome to part three, providing feedback and an organized grade book. We wanna have some announcements before we get started. The first one is that you can earn CEUs for attending this webinar. So you just have to fill out a form, whether you've attended the webinar live or you've watched the recording, and it has some questions for you to answer about the content in the webinar, as well as some general questions about your teaching. For each time you want CEUs from a webinar, you have to fill out a separate form. The forms, are different for each webinar, so there are some repeated questions that you don't have to answer after you've a, answered them the first time, but the ones that are required are indicated on the form. Um, adjunct faculty should complete this as well, even though CEUs may not be relevant at this time for them in the same way. Uh, doing the form allows this webinar to be on your transcript, and then anytime you need to indicate what professional development you've done, you can see your transcript to see the list of workshops and webinars and other professional development that you've participated in. This webinar is a number three part in a five-part series. So today we are doing number three, providing feedback in an organized gradebook. We have two more coming up and I will talk about those at the end of the session to give you a little preview. And today what we're gonna talk about is going fully online, what that means, compassionate pedagogy and student perceptions, efficient and effective feedback, gradebook features, and we will take question and answer breaks throughout. And Janet will sort through the chat questions and she will feed Karen questions related to things that she thinks need to be demonstrated. Other questions get answered through the chat. All right, so a few announcements. As we all found out last week, Harper is moving all classes to a fully online format for the remainder of spring 2020 and for summer 2020 for the safety and health of all Harper students, faculty, and staff. So we are currently in this flexible off-campus instruction mode until next Monday, April 13th, at which point all classes should have materials and structure in place to be considered fully online. Now, as we talk about what fully online means, some of you may find that the strategies you have developed during flexible off-campus instruction have already gotten you and your students to this point, and you can largely continue to operate as you have been since March when we left the physical campus. Some of you may find you need to make some adjustments, and that's okay. What this webinar series is here to help with. So, you are taking a great step in the right direction today. While we will be focusing on spring 2020, all of the principles and approaches discussed will also apply to getting a summer 2020 course prepared online, if that applies to you. So let's talk about what moving fully online means. Fully online means that you're teaching, the students are learning, and your communication with students is still happening. But rather than happening from a specific time when your course was meeting, it is now happening asynchronously. We know some faculty have pulled their students to find times that many can meet online for synchronous sessions, and that's okay, but synchronous sessions have to be optional and should be recorded for students who cannot attend so they can access them later. 
A true asynchronous fully online learning experience means that each week or at another regular interval, interval, you provide your students content to review and assignments to complete electronically. Students then work through the material and assignments at their own pace at times that work for them throughout the week. They will then provide you with their work each week by a given deadline and you will provide feedback and hopefully some much needed encouragement. In this weekly pattern, everyone will move through the remaining weeks of the semester together. A fully online course also means that students need to connect with you and with other students using electronic means such as email, online discussion boards, online announcements, or virtual conferencing tools. Taking simple steps to connect with students regularly throughout the remaining weeks of the course goes a long way in building a sense of community in your classroom. We will be focusing on communications and building community in our next webinar on Tuesday. Third, moving your course to fully online for the spring 2020 semester means continuing to be flexible, both with your students and with your expectations for yourself and for your course. That flexibility can be a very important factor considering that providing effective and efficient feedback using Blackboard tools can be challenging. And that's what we're focusing on today. What fully online doesn't mean is that your class has to look or run a certain way. While we have templates we can provide to help you, there is no expectation that you use certain pieces of technology or insert specific things into your course. Fully online also doesn't mean that you are expected to become an expert in advanced technology. We will be showing you how to use Blackboard, our online course platform, because we feel that can greatly benefit you and your students to get through this. But we don't expect you to become an expert in it or to learn how to use every feature. What we do hope is that even though this situation is unfortunate, we will all learn many helpful skills that will improve teaching and learning at Harper going forward. Fully online also doesn't mean you have to give up on a meaningful learning experience. Not only can your students continue to work and explore their discipline through the assignments and activities you create, but working in the online environment can teach us all a great deal about courage, perseverance, time management, creativity, flexibility, and compassion during this time. That leads us very well into a discussion on compassionate pedagogy, which we have carried through our previous webinars. So we wanted to ask you, do you remember receiving feedback from an instructor that really cut you down and made you feel lousy? Or was just confusing and you didn't quite know what they meant? Or made you feel good but didn't really offer suggestions for growth? Here are a few points largely related to what we've been studying this year on bandwidth recovery, the book by Sia Versheldon. Students' sense of belonging relies on their beliefs that faculty are compassionate and caring and that each student is more than just a face in the crowd. And that can be hard to do in an online course, so it's important that we try to establish and maintain that presence and that connection. Providing specific, candid, and supportive coaching for ongoing improvement helps students feel seen and valued, especially from a distance. An instructor warmth and organization is associated with student motivation and achievement. For some of us, warmth comes easier than organization or organization comes easier than warmth, but we want to really try to find both in our teaching, especially now. Some other things to consider is that students respond better when feedback is targeted on a few major skills or areas to improve. Consider their attention span, and this comes from some of the research in how learning works. Students will pay more attention if feedback is received in the immediacy of completing an assignment when it still feels relevant. So here are some tips. Try to block out time in your calendar to give prompt feedback when you know assignments are due or find time daily to do some grading when assignments are coming in at a steady clip. Also, you might want to create what I would call clipboard content or content that you can uh, copy and paste, but customize for each student. So things that you're going to have to write about for a lot of students, you can take, copy, add some things and customize and paste into various rubrics that we're going to talk to you about later. And I want you to consider that efficient grading is a means to get more relevant and timely feedback to a student. So rather than spend a large amount of time and then perhaps get overwhelmed with grading, we do want to help you to be a little more efficient so you can get feedback to students right away, but still have customized, personalized feedback. So here's a little guide for efficient and effective feedback. We featured this, this semester in a Lunch and Learn. We hope to be back to doing Lunch and Learns soon. 
So anyhow, when you do give feedback, you want to think of these three layers to the feedback. First, recognizing effort or improvement or performance, something positive, and try to use the student's name. Next, identify something specific that the student can improve upon. Try to pull out an example from their writing or from their specific assignment so that you, they know that you're really talking to them. And then last, provide detailed information and resources to address the issue. This, again, is material that you can have in what I call that clipboard of things ready to go. And since we're teaching online, sometimes hyperlinks work well in that as well. We also want to remind you that after this webinar, if you still have questions or new questions pop up, you can fill out the online instruction support form at harperacademy.net. That's that green box in the right hand side. And we also have what's circled in red there, uh, lots of resources and support online that you can find that might help answer your question. Now I'm going to turn it over to Karen. And she's going to talk mostly about the technical training on Blackboard for giving feedback and all the grading tools we have in Gradebook. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Karen Harold, and um, uh, I miss you all and can't wait till we can all get back to school and be together again. Um, I'm going to talk today about the Grade Center and Blackboard and um, uh, show you some of the different tools and different ways you can set your gradebook up. I'm going to start with comparing the Grade Center options um, for your gradebook. Um, there's two options. You can build your gradebook by using points, which you can see in this example, or you can build it by weighting your categories, which I'm showing in this example. When you weight your categories, it is a little more flexible uh, because you, whether you have one quiz or five quizzes, your quizzes are still at 15% of your total grade. When you're using points, you have to figure out how to factor that in in your points. Um, and once your syllabus is created, there really is not much flexibility for that. Uh, there is some flexibility in the weighting, though, because you can add or delete depending on increase or decrease of workload in your course. So here's just two options I'm showing you by points or by weights. And I'm going to show you how to create both of those. I'm going to have to take you in between screens, so bear with me for a minute. Okay, let's talk about points first. Um, one second here. I'm going to show you how to um, create a grade center using. Uh, being point based. First, I'm going to go down into the full grade center. And you're going to see here that you have a total column, which is point based, and you have a weighted total, which is um, weight based. So, first, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how to create some categories. Whether you're using points or weighting, it's always good to drop your columns into categories because then if you want to copy your grade book and you want to use it again for future semesters, your columns will be in the correct categories, and you can just simply migrate over to weight-based if you want to use that, um, that way to do your gradebook. So I'm going to take you up to Manage here. Click on Categories. You can see here there are default categories that Blackboard puts in. Um, they're, they're the ones that do not have the boxes in front of them. These ones that have the boxes in front of them in caps are the ones I created. So you can use what they have, or you can create your own category. But I'm going to show you how to do that. It's simply create category, type in the name of your category, and click on Submit. And you will see that you now have the unit test category in here. That This is going to be the first thing you're going to want to do before you even start setting up your gradebook, is go in here and just create categories that you're going to use in your um, grade center. And then we're going to click on OK. Now, if you're going to use a point-based grade center, you can create columns from scratch, or you can use integrated columns like you see here, discussion boards and um, assignments. So I'm going to show you how to create a column from scratch. We're going to click on Create Column. We're going to type in the title of the column. Now, you can show you can show your primary display, your output, as score, 
percentage, letter, complete, incomplete. But for today, we're going to use score because I'm using points. You can show a secondary display. The students will not see the secondary. This is only for you in your grade book. You can see it output two ways in points and percentage. The student will only see what's in the primary. Then we're going to come to the category, and I'm going to drop this in the research papers. Now, once again, I'm not waiting, but I'll have this in the category if I need it for future use. And then I'm going to put the points to this column, and I'm going to click on Submit. When you add a new column to the Grade Center, it always comes to the end of your uh, Grade Center. I will show you in a little bit how to organize this Grade Center so you can move these columns around. So basically what you're doing here is you're creating columns with points and you also have some uh, integrated columns with points like this lecture guide right here. You can see there's 30 point possible points to this. So once you have all your columns in place, you are simply clicking on the cells and putting the points in. That one is manual, and you can see that it shows you the score and it shows you the percentage. Once again, the students will only see what's in the first slot here. So you just simply click in your cells and you put in the amount of whatever the student got for that um, assessment. And then if you look over here under total, you'll see 80 points. I just put the research paper in for 50 and I put the discussion board in for 30. So this is simply just adding up points as you're going along. Um, so the, so that's, that's a point-based uh, grade book. And there's a lot more to go over, but I'm just simply showing you how the columns work with these totals. So if we're going to wait, we're going to click on the down chevron next to the weighted total. We're going to click on edit column information. Now we're going to scroll down to the bottom and we're going to grab these categories, the ones that we dropped our columns into. And we're going to move these over. I'll grab my attendance. So now that you have all your categories over here and all of your columns should be in categories, you can simply put the weights on the categories. And you can also do things like drop a highest grade, drop a lowest grade. You can actually weight the columns equally or proportionally. So if you have different points on your assignments, it will actually weigh them proportionally for you. So I'm just going to go down, put my percentages in, and you'll see down here it's at a total weight of 100%. And then I'm going to click on Submit. So now I have my weighted total column as well as my total with my points. Now, depending on what you're doing, you should be rating the other column from the students. If you are simply doing point-based grade center, you can completely delete the weighted column by clicking on the down chevron and clicking delete. If you decide to wait at a later time, you can come up here to create calculated column and you can add another weighted column. And if you are just so, and if you are so, if you're doing points, get rid of the weighted total column. On the other hand, if you are doing a weighted total column, you need to hide by clicking on the down chevron, hide from students. You need to hide the point column. The students get very confused because these don't match same, same. Obviously, if you're weighting grades, different assessments have different weights. So if they see 90 out of 100 points that they think they should be getting an A, it might not be depending on the weight of your categories. So if you are waiting, always hide your total point column so the student cannot see that. Um, in this way, less confusion. So once again, um, columns in the Grade Center could consist of integrated columns like this or manual columns like this one right here. And you will either be putting in the grades or the integration will take care of the grades, then your next choice is do I want to do points or am I doing weighted total? And then that's the decision you have to make. So that's um, uh, categories uh, and weighted total versus uh, point total. I I'm going to talk about a few tools that we have going on here that you can integrate into your Blackboard session. Let's talk about the attendance tool. Under course tools here, if you click on attendance, 
this will automatically integrate your attendance tool into your grade center. You can use this tool as a visual to keep students on track, or you can actually use it to factor into your total grade, whether that's weighted or whether it's point total. Um, first of all, let's look at the menus up here. The gear setting allows you to change the percentages of what you want uh, to show for the students. You can also change the grade using points, percentage, or letter, but we're going to leave this at points because that's what we're working with right now. That's the gear. You have two menus here. The meeting menu brings up today. The overall menu brings up your whole grade center. Now, the dates will pop in as the days go on. It always says today, yesterday, and then the previous dates. And then tomorrow it will roll over and this date will be here and so on and so forth. So you can either go to the meeting tab or you can go to the overall tab and you can mark um, you can mark wherever you need to mark people absent, people present, people late. And um, you can do this for either tab. What's nice for you is on the overall tab or the meeting on the on the meeting tab it just shows the individual student but on the overall tab you can see an average attendance of your class up here and you can see what each student is doing as far as attendance is going So once you've decided to use this and you simply just click on just click on um uh the 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 cells that you want to use here whether they're present later absent then you can go back into your full grade center. Once you are in here, you can see your attendance is picking up right here. Now you can decide to use this as built into your total weight, your, your total points, your weight. If you choose just to use it as a visual, you need to click on the down chevron, click on edit column information, and you need to take this out of the grade center calculations. So the students will still see this column, but it will be not it will not be factored in. Some faculty factor it in, some do not. So real quick, I'm going to jump to the student view just to show you what they see in that um, attendance. If I click on my grades and I click on the attendance feature, and it is not live here. What is going on? Let me see here. Hold on. Let me go back to full grade center. Um, I see that Karen Quattrochi has, oh, let me go back and back to the attendance and mark Karen Quattrochi preview user. Um, so I'm present today. Overall, let me, I'm just going to reset these. I think that uh, when I took myself out of here, it knocked me out. So let's do that. I just reset all those days. Now I'm going to go back into the full grade center. Now I'm going to go into the student account. I'm going to go into my grades. Now on my attendance, you see that it's blue. I can click on my attendance. And this gives me a great visual of how I'm sitting to date in this course. It shows here when the meetings were. It shows that my instructor marked me. And it shows what I got for each day. Up here, it shows that I'm sitting 70 out of 100. I have three present, one late, one absent. This is a great visual for the students. So even if you decide not to factor this into your total score, I highly recommend using this so the students can see in real time where their attendance sits. So that's the attendance tool. I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, we had a question the other day about late work. You can see that I created a column down here called late assignment demonstration. If a student hands something in late, if it's if you put a due date on an assignment and they hand it in late, it will come in marked late. That's why due dates are really important to use throughout Blackboard. If I click on this down chevron and I click on view grade details, it will show here that the student is late. This was submitted late. You can see that. You have a record of it. And then you can grade as you see fit to grade. And if there's a question on it, you have it recorded in here that it is um, marked late. 
So that's what the, the due date will do for you in assignment if a student submits past the due date. And I'm also going to show you how to create an extra credit column. We're going to go up to create column. We're going to call this column extra credit. We're going to leave it as a score. Um, if you're using points, you don't need to drop it in a category. Um, um, or, and if you're waiting, you can always add it to that category, and I can show you how to do that. I will show you that later. And I'm going to click on put zero in the points and click on submit. Extra credit categories always have to be zero. So the people that do the work, they get the points. Say your extra credit is worth 10, they get the points. The people that do not do the extra credit do not get penalized. Because this is factored at zero, it will not penalize those that do not do extra credit. So that's how to create an extra credit column. So that takes care of the first slide that we, um, we are covering. I'm going to go back to the slides and see if Janet has any questions she's got looming for us. Let me get back to the slide. So this was the slide that we just covered. Uh, Janet, are there any questions? Hi, Karen. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, so okay. let's start with some questions about attendance. Can you show how to put or change the dates in the attendance column? And also, can you add extra columns in attendance? Yes. OK. So I will go back to the attendance, which is under course tools and attendance. When I go into the overall tab, I can, if I click on any plus button in between columns, I can add a column. I can actually click on the date and I can edit the meeting and I can change the date. So that's how you add columns um, in between ones that are already there. And I can just change this. I mean, this doesn't make any sense, but just for today's purposes, I'll just change it to the 14th. So you can see that it's changed. Um, so that's added, adding the column. And what was the second one, Janet? I'm sorry. Oh, we also showed how to change the date, too. OK, so, so I answered both of them? Yes, you answered both of them at the same time. Perfect. OK. okay. okay. Another question um, in the attendance tool is, can you change the the percentage for the late attendance. So how could you change the different percentages within okay. the attendance? Okay, up here on the gear, you can change your present to 100. You can change your late to, while the present stays at 100. I'm sorry, you cannot change that one. You cannot, you cannot manipulate the present or the absent. They're there or they're not. So on the late, you can change this to 90. You can change this to whatever you want to here. And um, we'll take it. And once you change that, Click on save. I'm locked up here for some reason, so I can't follow through with this. Let's see if it'll let me do it. Yeah, it did. Okay. So that's how you do it through the gear here. You can not only you can change this and you can also change the output, points, percentage, or letter grade. But that's done through the gear. Okay, the next question is in the grade book and it concerns extra credit points. So for extra credit points, do I to create an extra credit column or can I just give more points for an assignment? So for example, if an assignment is worth 50 points, can I give 55 points for extra credit? Yes, you can. Um, the cell is open. It does not limit you to the points you put on that column and you can always go over and it does add it to the total. So yes, that does work too. Okay, and one more question. Um, is there a difference between assigning extra credit if you are doing total points or if you are waiting grades, waiting your points? Um, there is a, uh, there is a, if you are either way, whether you're doing total or whether you're doing weighted, you have to create another total column and you have to add those columns to the extra credit column. Um, I will put a uh, short video together to show how to do that, and I will put it out on our resource page. But yes, you can add to both, but you don't add directly into the column. You have to create another uh, set of combinations in order to make that happen. If 
you are, um, in fact, especially with waiting, that, that, that's how you have to take care of that. So I will put a video together and I'll put it out on our website. Okay, thanks, Karen. That's all for now. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing our files. And I believe I just want to show what we're going to cover on 14. Um, we will be covering some of the options in the Grade Center. We will be covering how to keep your gradebook up to date and organized. And I'm also going to show you where the legend is so you get to know all of these icons. So I'm going to go back into Blackboard. Go back into the full Grade Center. So first, um, let's talk about this Manage Option button up here. Um, we, there, there's a few of these menus that you're going to use quite a bit, so I'm going to cover the ones that are used all the time. Um, if you want to get to know any of these a little more, dig deeper into the Grade Center, please submit a ticket on Blackboard, and one of us will sit with you one-on-one and, -on -one and work with you. So I'm going to cover here what, what you're going to be using most of the time. We talked about categories. I'm going to open it one more time and show you. Here is where you created your categories in order to drop your columns into the proper categories. Now I'm going to talk about smart views. You can create a smart view, and all that means is that pulls the information out of your grade center when you set up certain uh, criteria. So I can create a smart view called group two. I'm going to do this as a user uh, smart view. I'm going to say user, and I'm going to select all users, and I can filter by columns, um, selected columns only, select and ca selected categories. There's a lot of criteria how you can have this show, but basically this is pulling, filtering chunks out of your grade center and giving you a view. So say I have all of these students just in group two, and I want to keep them together. I can go to Manage Smart Views. I can click on group two, and now this just pulls up group two and all of their work associated with them. So there's different ways to filter through this. You can go into Manage Smart Views and you play around with this, but this gives you different views of your grade center. So that's the first one. Um, now let's talk about column organization. Click on column organization, and this shows your grade center top to bottom, which is also left to right in your grade center. But this shows what the student sees. The student sees this top to bottom. So with that in mind, I suggest you always keep your totals at the top. You always keep your attendance at the top. And then the rest of your work, you can either add it by content or I would suggest adding it chronologically so the, so the student sees their grades as they're coming in and they don't have to search for them. So if you remember, when you add a column to the grade book, it always adds it to the end. So if you go into column organization, column organization lets you drag and drop your columns and move them around and reset them. So you can just move things around by grabbing the um, crosshairs here and dragging up and down. And once you have all that in place, you can click on submit. I also wanted to show you, remember how I had you dropping your columns into categories? Um, if, if, if you forget to do that, and all of a sudden at the end of your grade book, you decide you want to wait your grades, you can always come in here into column organization, and you can grab whatever columns belong in a certain category, check them, and say change category, and you can change all of them at once. So we can take these, change category, change all of them at once. So this column organization view allows you to move things, allows you to assign categories. You can bulk delete here by clicking on the checkboxes and click delete. So the column organization gives you a, a more flexible view of your grade center. So once you've made all your changes, you can click on submit. And your changes will take what will show here in, um, in your grade book. Um, one thing that you need to be very um, cognizant of is keeping your grade center updated and keeping it organized and keeping it clean. Get, we get a lot of calls from, from students who see columns that, that they don't know why they're there or how come they have no grade or how come their total doesn't and their, and their grade center doesn't match the total on your syllabus. 
Well, a lot of it is because um, of not keeping this grade center clean. So if you have a column that you're not using, first of all, if, you're, if you know you're not going to use it, you can simply click on the down chevron and delete it. If you decide you might want to use it in a, in a future course but you, and, and you don't want to delete it, there's two things you have to do. You have to click the down chevron. You have to go and edit column information. You have to take it out of the grade center calculations, and you have to take it out of the student's view. If you do not do both of those, it will continue to be in the grade center calculation. It will continue to be in their view, even if you go to the chevron and you hide it from yourself. Hiding it from yourself just takes it visibly out of your grade book. It does not take it out of the student's grade book. It does not take it out of the student's calculations. So please be aware of that. When you're building your grade book, delete anything you don't need and take out of the calculations and out of the um, uh, grade book of the students if you don't want to delete it, but you do not want to, you might want to use it at a later time. So by keeping the, that clean and keeping all of your columns organized, it's, it's just a better experience for the student. Um, if you have students that you haven't seen in a while, but they haven't actually dropped the course and you're not sure where they are, but you are tired of scrolling through your grade book to scroll past their names, you can hide students out of your grade center. If you go to manage and you go to row visibility, you can take any user, you can say hide row, submit, and it takes that student out of your grade book. You can go back to row visibility and bring them back in if in fact they return. But this way it at least saves you a little scrolling if you have a few that haven't been there but, you, but you're not sure if they've dropped or not. Um, so that's probably the most things that you'll be using in the manage right now. Let's go to reports. You can view your grade history at any time which shows every single click and grade that you have done in this grade center since you started the class. It gives you dates. It tells you what column it is, last edited by, user, value, um, everything. So that is under reports, view grade history. You can also create a simple report to share with your students on how they're doing in the course. Put my report name on there. I'm just going to say selected user. I'll grab myself. And you can bring in all the user information if you want. And you can bring in all the columns or just certain columns. And then click on submit. This basically just pulls up a paper copy of how the student is doing. And you can, you can print this. Um, well, you can download it and you can share it with your students. If you're having a one-on-one -on -one with them, you could even just leave it up on the screen here like I'm doing right now. And you can have when you're having a one on one with them, but it pretty much pulls up just their row out of your grade book so you can uh, go over their grades with them. That's reports, create report. Um, you can filter your grade book. If I click on the filter button right here, I can filter by full grade center, I can filter by group, by smart view. Um, there's different ways to pull the information out of your grade center that you want to look at. So, but I'm going to go back to the full grade center because that's the default. You can filter by category, assignment, attendance, um, all different ways that you can, um, uh, through the categories, you can filter this grade center. You can also filter by status, completed, exempt, in progress, needs grading. So there's different ways to pull all of your information up here by using the criteria and the filtering tool right here. Um, another tool that you're going to want to make sure that you're aware of is the work offline tool. At the end of the semester, I know that your department um, requires to get an Excel spreadsheet from you out of Blackboard. So how that's done is you're going to point to work offline, click on download. Just accept all the defaults and click on submit. Follow the prompts, click on download. You will see down here, it opens it up into an Excel spreadsheet. I can then open it. And I can do a file save as. I can save it to my desktop and then email it to my um, department. So that is how you get your grades 
off of Blackboard. It's in the Grade Center, Work Offline, Download button. Um, that pretty much covers this slide. I'm going to go back. So I can remind you what we covered and ask Janet if there are any questions. Okay, Karen, Janet, question. Question. Yep. Yep, I'm here. Question about the smart view. Um, so a faculty member, they there's multiple instructors in a course. Can they use smart view as a way to split up grading? Different, like they each have different groups of students that they grade. Yes, they can. They just have to make sure they label them right. So if you know, if if um, if there's three instructors, and uh, just make sure that they label the smart view with their name, so they know they'll still they have to go into smart view and click on it, but they can organize their own students that way. Okay, and is smart view also a way that instructors could? monitor um, students who are struggling in the course or maybe students who haven't had great attendance in the course and not really turning in a lot of work? Um, yes, you can. I mean, if, if you can, but that's really not the tool to be uh, using for that. I would suggest using the retention center tool and um, uh, either, either Janet or I can send um, send a link out or we can put it out on I don't know the best way probably put the link out on our um, on our website but there's a tool called the retention tool and you can set up not get up back here but you can set up alerts you can set up alert by assessment if they fall below a certain point you can set up an alert by logins so you can track you know how, how if they're logging in enough you can set up an alert by attendance you can set up an alert by um, activity so it's called the retention center it is in your menu let me show you I will go back here hold on I'm not gonna get uh, I won't get very deep into this at all but I'll just show you where it's at you can go in and play with it and then we will put the resources out there down here under evaluation and it's called the retention center if you click on it students currently at risk this is an at-risk tool so you can customize and create um, activity rule access rule grade rule missed deadline so once again I will put more information for that out on our website um, any more Janet okay we have one more question um, is there a way that I could email students who haven't turned in a specific assignment? Is there an easy way to do that rather than just going through every single student and seeing whether they turned it, turned it in? Well, you have to look at your grade book to see if they turned it in. So once you look at your grade book, you can, what you can do, like over here, Karen, if I see that, um, um, say my attendance is sitting at um, 50 or 40, I can go right here next to my name and I can say email user. So while that is on my mind, I can come straight across here. This, I got 50, um, maybe this was worth 100. So as you're going through the rows, um, because you see this is locked in, so as you're going through your columns, if you're seeing issues here, you can email the student right to the left here. I believe that's what they're asking, right, Janet? Yeah, yeah. I, think okay. so. um, I also think I think at the top of the column assignment too, that might be where they were pointing. Where you could, I think you could email all the students. Um, the drop down. Oh, up and manage. Up and manage. Um, in the column header first. I think they're asking more for a specific assignment. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so. No, that's okay. So, so they're looking for an actual assignment. So, what if? So, are they? Am I assuming that that everyone? in this assignment is, is getting an email? Yeah, is there a way from there that, that it will just send an email to the people who didn't turn it in? Or do they have to go through and look and then email the, the student? Yeah, no, there's no, there's no, um, there's no magic uh, reply. No, there is not, if that's what they're asking, no. Okay. And, and one it. thing that I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Janet. No, I was gonna say that's it for questions. Okay, okay. One thing that I did um, uh, forget to show you is the icon legend down here. 
Um, get familiar with these icons because these are the icons that will pop up in your cells. Um, uh, needs grading, you can see here, is the circle with the exclamation point. Override, there's a little orange in, in the corner of the cell here. Attempt in progress means like a student is, 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 in the, is in the process of taking a test. So this is your icon legend down here. If you ever have any questions of what all of the icons are in your cells, click on that and that will help you. Um, so that covers that, those two slides. Now what we're going to do is come back to a slide that um, Stephanie and I are going to work on together. Um, she's going to talk. I'm going to drive for the first two bullet points. And um, I will talk. i got to get to the right one. There it is. And then I will take care of the last bullet point. So, Stephanie, I will hand it back to you. All right, so we're going to go over together some Blackboard grading tools that can allow faculty to give that effective and efficient feedback we were talking about at the beginning of the session and that Karen just had up for us for a few seconds there as a nice review. So we're going to look at inline grading tools, so how you can mark up documents that students turn in, some ways that you can use rubrics maybe that you've already created, and then she's also going to talk to you about Blackboard rubrics. So that means rubrics that you can make in Blackboard. So the first thing we're going to do is look at inline grading tools. So when students submit assignments as attachments in Word or as PDFs, you can use inline grading tools to mark their papers. So often students might turn in things as a link to a Google Doc or even an Apple Pages. Um, those are things they might have done, you know, at their previous school that worked okay. But in this case, if you want to be able to use inline tools, you have to help them get support on how to download a Google Doc, for example, into a, turn it into a Word document or a PDF. So if they do submit it in a format that you can't open and mark on with the inline tools, you can just ask them to resubmit. So we'll use a sample student reflection paper to demonstrate how you can mark something both with a pen tool and then also with a mechanism that you can put in thought bubbles. So Karen's going to pull up a sample student reflection paper just so we can demonstrate what those tools look like. And again, students can turn in documents and formats that sometimes you can open and read, but to be able to use these inline grading tools in Blackboard and save those comments, you need it to be a Word or a PDF. So here's our sample reflection paper. So the first thing we're gonna look at is this pen tool. So if you click on that pen icon in the, in the upper right-hand corner, this pen tool works well for circling or underlining, you know, if you wanna mark something on the paper to get it attention, but not so well for written comments. It's kind of sloppy to write with a tool like this. So more commonly for written comments, faculty will use the comment bubble feature and that is the other icon right next to the pen there. That's a comment, uh, comment bubble. And you can click on the tool and then click on the area you want to write a comment. And then you can type in the comment in the text box and then you can post the comment. So students will be able to see the comments by opening the graded assignment and then scrolling through and then clicking through and, and actually clicking on those blue thought bubble or comment bubbles, but, and this isn't common, but if they need to have a list of the comments written out fully, they can also open and print the comments in a different format in which the comment bubbles actually convert to numbers within the document, and then the list of numbered comments appear on the page. So we want to talk to you about some options for providing um, feedback also using rubrics. So let's transition over to rubrics. You might have some rubrics that you've previously created for assignments in Word. You can still use those rubrics by sharing the completed rubrics either by uh, filling them in and then copying and pasting them into the feedback box. And you see that feedback to learner box there on the right hand side. Or if you look, there's also a paper clip at the bottom left-hand corner of the Feedback to Learner box that allows you to attach a completed rubric. So we're going to look at this first example, which 
we, we've we been referring, referring to as the highlight rubric because it shows how faculty can generate a rubric with some comments that are pre-existing in the table and then faculty can highlight to give feedback on the assignment criteria by choosing the comments that apply and using the highlight tool. So this works well for shorter assignments where you want to give quick feedback as it saves some time but still gives students a clear sense of what is expected. Of course, you want to attach any rubrics you have to the assignment instructions wherever you have provided the assignment prompt and instructions. You do want to include your rubrics there. But then, after they've submitted assignments and you're ready to grade them, you can pull up that same rubric and you can provide feedback for each student. And then, like I said, um, you can either copy and paste the entire rubric um, or you can save it and attach it to that feedback box. So even though the highlighted comments may seem pretty general, if you scroll down to the bottom of this rubric, you can see that you can give customized overall feedback below the rubric. So this example follows that module from the beginning of the webinar that we talked about where you want to recognize the student's effort or something that they've improved on or something, you know, that stands out with their performance. So you want to start with the positive. Then you want to identify something that they can improve. improve. So you want to uh, refer to something specific in their assignment they can improve upon. And then you want to provide some coaching and resources. So this just serves as an example of that. So again, that sometimes that coaching and resources is something that you've pre-written because you might have to say that to multiple students and then you can customize it. So that third part, the first and second part, you're going to want to write, you know, original comments that are very specific to the student. And again, try to use the student's name and try to pull out a specific example uh, when possible. So you can put a score in the feedback box. Um, there's a little field for the score right above that empty box for the table um, when you're in Blackboard and then you can click up just click on control A so when you're in Word if you want to uh, copy the whole document this works well with a, a table that's a rubric like this you can hit control A to copy the whole thing gets everything on the page very cleanly and then control V to paste the entire rubric into the feedback to student field or like I mentioned before you can take another few steps and save the rubric in Word or as a PDF and then attach it to the feedback box. And we showed you what Karen's marking right there is that, that little um, paper clip is supposed to be where you can attach something. So either way, students will be able to see the entire rubric there. So before we show you what that looks like in the gradebook, we wanted to look at a, a different type of rubric that's also created in a table, but it allows for more extensive comments for major assignments where you want to give you know some longer more detailed custom feedback so this rubric has blank fields um so sorry about that i keep flipping out okay that's all right plenty to say here um <laughs> this type of rubric would be one where we have a table again but the table has blank fields and then you populate um those fields with customized content for the criteria so in that row you would write a comment um, that's specific to that criteria. And then at the end, again, you would do an overall comment. So you can see that this example, again, follows the model of recognizing that effort or improvement or performance, then identifying something specific to improve, and then providing coaching and resources. If you scroll down to the bottom of that document, um, down even further, there's where you can put your overall comment. Uh, okay, so those are two types of rubrics that you can use, but I would remind you that these, while these work well with inline grading comments, you want to remind students that you do have in-text comments for them. So you could either put that in the rubric um, when you put your general comment, or you might also want to post it um, in an announcement, if you post an announcement letting students know that you graded their assignment. Sometimes faculty spend a lot of time putting inline comments and rubrics in and then students aren't necessarily aware that they have to click on their score and um, go in and look for that feedback. All right, so now we're going to talk about 
creating rubrics in Blackboard. So Karen's going to show you how you can actually, you know, take the same criteria but create a rubric that you can use within Blackboard. Okay, can you hear me guys? Yes. Okay, that's my, my audio kept flipping off. Okay, so now I'm going to show you <clears throat> how to use a rubric that was already created in Blackboard to do the exact same thing that Stephanie just did. Um, in Blackboard, under Course Tools, there is a rubric tool. You can click on Create Rubric, and you will see here that it gives you the template with your levels of achievement, your criteria, and then you can put your um, uh, wording in there. You can change from percentage to points. There's there's all kinds of different things. You can change point range. I'm not going to get into this tool right now. Um, once again, we will sit with you if you want to learn how to use it. Submit a ticket and one of us will call you. But I just want you to be aware that you can create a rubric in Blackboard. And I created one and it sits right here. So that's course tools, <clears throat> rubrics. Now, when I created my assignment, which was called uh, the assignment with the Blackboard rubric, when I created it, there's an option when you create an assignment from scratch to add the rubric right here. So I pointed to the uh, down chevron and I click on select rubric. It pulls up this rubric and then I go ahead and attach it. So now this rubric is attached to this assignment. And I'm going and then I clicked on submit and that put it in, in with the assignment. So when the student goes to submit their um, paper to you or submit their assessment assignment to you. Once again, it comes through with the exclamation point in the circle. And I'm going to do exactly what I, what, what I just did with stuff. I'm going to click the down chevron and click on attempt. This is a different submittal, so the markings are not here. I'm not going to go through that again. We just went through it with her. So she pasted her rubric in right here, or she could have added it right here with the paper clip. With the built-in rubric, if you click on this link right here, and you click on show description and show feedback, you can pull up the rubric you created in Blackboard, and you can give feedback here. You can click on whichever one, whichever level they got to, you can click feedback for each individual area, and you can also override the score here if you decide to give them extra points for something. So it's telling me it pulled seven points out of ten, but you can override this to eight if you want and put your reason for that. So you're allowed to override the points, but here is where you work right through your rubric right in front of you because it's already built in. So I'm going to click on Save Rubric, and you're going to see that it automatically put the points right here. It takes the points from the rubric, and it puts it right in the attempt, whereas before I had to type them in. In this feedback box where Stephanie put her rubric, you can also use this for feedback to the student that they will see in the bubble. And I'll show you, I'm going to show you how they see both of these experiences, what Steph did and what I did. And I'm going to click on submit. Now you can see my grade is here with the Blackboard rubric. Here's her grade with her Word rubric. I'm going to go into the student view and I'm going to click on my grades. If you notice, hers doesn't, I have a view rubric under mine. She does not. This is the difference between the two. She put her rubric in this bubble here where the student can see the actual rubric that she cut and pasted. I used the bubble to tell the student, please see me. Um, so I just use that just for, just, just to get a hold of them. Over here, both work the same as far as finding your comments. You click on the actual title of the assignment, and in Stephanie's, you will see that the comments show here, and her rubric shows over here.
the one that I created actually has a link that says view rubric and it pulls up the rubric that was created in Blackboard. You can have grid view or you can have list view. You can show descriptions and you can show feedback. So this is what the student would see. If it was list view, this would be grid, grid view. All the feedback would be in with the box that was chosen for their level, their attempt. Down here was that bubble that I put feedback into. And also, I tell it says here it was a value of 7, but it has been overridden with 8 out of 10. So we both did the same thing in just a little bit different way. She used a rubric that she already had created in Word. I went in and I created one in Blackboard. Both options work great. Um, so whichever one works for you, uh, that, that, that's, that's the one you go with. So this is the student view once again. I'm going to get out of here. And um, I guess I'm going to ask Janet. Janet, are there any questions right now? Hi, Karen. Um, currently, there's no questions about rubrics um, or feedback. So you can continue. OK. So I'm going to go back to the actual. PowerPoint. So Stephanie can get back on here and finish up with you. And I want to thank you all for coming. My part is done. I hope you all have a beautiful weekend. And I'm handing it over to Steph. Thanks, Karen. So again, we wanted to remind you that if you still have more questions or as you start working on these things, questions arise, you can fill out our online instruction support form there. Um, it's that green box right there. Or as Karen mentioned, she's continuing to develop along with the rest of our instructional design team videos and post other resources that help based on questions that come up. So those are important things for you to know about. While we're waiting to see if any other last questions arise, I do want to make a couple of announcements. One is we want to make sure you're aware that we do have some templates that you can request to have copy into your course shells. So for spring 2020, we have folders for the remaining weeks of the semester that can help you organize your content in a way that is consistent for students to navigate. We also have an entire course shell designed for summer 2020 courses that you can have copied into your summer 2020 course shells by request for designing a new course shell, or you can redesign an existing course using this really well-organized, well-developed template. Um, also, as a reminder, if you want CEUs, um, you need to go to the Academy webpage and click on the form for that for the webinar that you're looking for CEUs for and complete that. And those need to be submitted by May 1st. We also wanted to make an announcement that to support you as you grow in your online learning, Phil Mortensen, our distance learning manager, and Janet Woods, our instructional technologist that's um, manning the chat today, and I are creating an online community in Yammer for faculty called the Online Instruction Forum to discuss ideas and share resources related to questions and inquiries about distance education. So you should look for an invitation to join that group coming soon over Harper email. So again, we'll have one more opportunity for questions. I just wanted to let you know that that we have two more upcoming webinars next week. On Tuesday, Jenny Henriksen will be with us facilitating on best practices and communication and community building in the online environment. So more ideas for how to accomplish these things using Blackboard features are coming your way. And then on Thursday, Chris Dobson will be helping us to make sure we are aware of how to make our materials accessible. So as my, top, my shop teacher used to say, measure twice and cut once. We want to make sure that we're taking the time to make our course shells accessible for all students while we are creating them rather than having to go back and redo our work when we find out that they are not accessible. So that's an important webinar as well. Uh, Janet, are there any more things that we need to cover coming up in the chat? Hi, Steph. Um you know, for anybody who wants to stick around, we did have just a few Q&A questions. Um, and maybe there's there's a few things here that Karen can just demonstrate. One of them is if a student turns in via email rather than using the assignment tool in Blackboard, 
is there a way that you can attach their um, their what they turned in within the grade book? Yes, there. Yes, there is, Janet. Um, the the only way to really get this done is um, if you go down to the full grade center and you go to the cell of of the assignment that the student emailed to you but maybe didn't use the link you can click the down chevron and you can click on view grade details you have to click on manual override put the grade here and then click on this little paper clip browse your computer and attach the student's paper um now you'll see when i click on submit and then submit it stays here within the manual override um, this is the only way to get the paper in there for for record you know for your record that they submitted it so uh, if the student can see this because it's under feedback to learner and it also stays here under the override grade so you have a copy of it and they have a copy of it but this is how you accomplish that and then click on save okay that looks good. And I think another thing we, we pointed out when this came up before is that although you can do just what Karen showed you, if possible, you want to try to reach out to the student and ask them and help them to submit their assignments online via Blackboard so that they can learn that skill, so that they have that ability going forward. And then you don't have to worry about trying to find uh, their assignments via email. So just something to keep in mind. Was there anything else, Janet? Yeah, there's one more question. Um, there's a few people who use publisher content and they asked if there's a way that you could exclude tests or manipulate within your gradebook tests that are taken from the publisher site. Okay, um, all publishers work differently and right now we probably have you know half a dozen plus. And um, all of their sites or their servers work differently. So there's no one right answer for this. Um, you need to go to their site. And when you're creating your assessments there, I know some of them do a global sync where they sync everything to our gradebook. Um, some of them allow you to just sync assessment by assessment. So you need to find out what's going on at their end. And, and also, once they come into the Grade Center, um, there are some columns that you can manipulate and you can take them out of the Grade Center calculations and there's some that you can't. So every publisher works different, but the bottom line is they have a sync tool at their end and we have our end, which, which in theory should allow you to take out of calculations um, if you want to. Just going to have to figure out which publisher you have and how that works for the one you're working with. But, you know, once you figure that out, if you still have questions, you can contact any of us and we can help you. Um, we can help you with the mechanics once you figure out how the publisher end works. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Oh, we've had we've had one more question show up in the chat, um, and this is related to attendance, but it's also related to the Blackboard Collaborate tool. Is there a way that I could easily take attendance of the students who are in a one of my Blackboard Collaborate sessions? Yes, you can. There is an attendance feature, and let me see how I'm going to have to see. We're in as an we're in as moderator right now. Um, when you're in your course, okay. Let me show you this way. When you are in your course under my settings here, you will see that. Can can you guys see the actual uh, menu on the right hand side? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, it's not, yeah, I'm, this is what I'm going to do with that. Yes, you can record attendance, and yes, you can. It will go directly into your grade book. I'm having a hard time showing you it now because you have to do it before you enter the session. So once again, I've made myself a note. I will create a short video on how to use your attendance tool that's built into Blackboard, and it will directly populate a column in your grade center. And I will put that together. In order to make that happen, because you have to do it 
before being in a, um, a session, I have to have two live sessions opened with two different usernames and offer in order to show you that. So right now, that's not going to work. But I will create a video and I'll put it out on our um, website. Okay, thanks, Karen. That is all the questions for today. All right. Well, thank you, Janet, and thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, um, those of you who are still with us, for being here um, on this live webinar. And those of you who are accessing the recording, um, please remember that you can fill out that form for CEUs. And then you can also go to our website and fill out a form if you need more questions or want to remind us or you know request certain videos on topics that were mentioned today that people are looking for more support. We hope to see you at the next two webinars in this series. And please remember that we're here for you, we're standing by, and we hope to all be back together on campus soon. But in the meantime, as they're saying, we're all in this together. So take care and stay well.